Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us here at the Mechanics Institute at 57 Post Street in San Francisco. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events, and we are honored to be part of 5050 Day and its worldwide events, and the opportunity to present Bay Area women on the political front lines. Tonight, we certainly have six dynamic women to talk about how to become a civic leader in your community, city, and in our government, and what it will take to have a gender-balanced world. I want to particularly thank Kath Delaney of Madeira Group for her support in putting this incredible panel together and for leading this conversation. Now, for those of you who are new to the Mechanics Institute, I would like to invite you back on any Wednesday at noon for the free tour, which will give you an introduction to our history, our gorgeous general interest library, our international chess room, and our ongoing programs, which include panel discussions, author events, cinema at film series, our book clubs, writers groups, chess classes and tournaments, and more. Our events are open to the public, but we do hope that you'll consider becoming a member and enjoy the benefits of membership. So please come back to read, to work, engage, create, or just relax. And now I'd like to introduce filmmaker, visionary, mover and shaker, and social changer, Tiffany Schlein, founder of Let It Ripple Film Studio and the creator of 5050 Day. Tiffany, my hat off to you. Um, I'm so happy to be here. First of all, I love the Mechanics Institute. We moved here about, let me look over at you, about a year ago, and I feel such a sense of history of San Francisco, such a sense of community. There's so many incredible, lower, stand here. There's so many <laughs> incredible people in this building, and it really feels like you're a part of San Francisco history, and I love going to the library, and it just, the lecture series, it's so wonderful. So. The fact that we, I've actually been up since 2.30 in the morning. This is my last event of the day, which is a perfect way to close. We've, there's 35,000 events happening in 60 countries. We, yeah, for a 50, and 50, 50 day is a global day where there's people all around the world having events just like this, big, small, any size they show. We have a film, 50, 50. We have a new film that just premiered called uh, Why I Pledge 50, 50 with a pledge tool. And then they're having discussions like these with amazing, inspiring people that are helping to move the needle on this issue. So we went to India. We, uh, we, we did a kind of a live stream to India, Chile, Nigeria, the Empire State Building, the ERA Coalition had a big event in New York. They were live streaming. Jada Pinkett Smith, the actor and activist, um, actually had a conversation with kids in Sar at the Sarasota Military Academy. Um, talking about gender equality, it's been, a, it's been a crazy day. Incredibly inspiring. And I was so happy to see the panelists for this panel because first of all, you know, Bay Area women shaking it up and your work, we're friends also. Um, but you know, I feel like we are at a moment and we need to seize it. I mean, obviously people that have been in this, doing this work a long time, there's been many moments. This is a new kind of moment. But you know, more more than 500 women running for Congress and people running on all levels. The, the line that we say in our new film is there's 519,634 elected positions in the United States of America. Yeah, it's really interesting to think about on all levels and the percentage level. And in our most diverse Congress ever, it's still at 18% women. And so the women up here, 
are working to change that. And I was so honored that they were doing a 50-50 day event in, in our own building. It made me so happy. And um, I'm just, just delighted to be here. And I hope you have a great event. I have to actually go back up to the live stream. So, uh, but I'm going to watch. You're recording it. So <laughs> we will probably loop in on YouTube your conversation into the live stream, too. So have a great event. Thank you. Thanks, Tiffany. <laughs> and before we begin, I'd like to say we'll be having a reception afterwards. So please stick around and uh, meet each other and uh, join the call to action. Thank you, and here we go. Thank you, everybody. I'm Kath Delaney. I'm really excited about being here tonight, and I have a lot of friends and new friends on the panel. Um, it's an incredible week for women The week this week of April. Um, there's a lot of history for me in this week. I met Laura Shepard in New York um, organizing Earth Day in 1999, 1990. Um, so Laura and I go way back working on environmental and social justice work um, through the arts, and uh, Laura's an old dear friend, so thank you so much for having us tonight. You're really one of the most gracious people I know, so thank you so much for having us. Um, I was suggesting to Rose, and I'll introduce, introduce everybody in a moment, that maybe actually we could just take all a moment and have just a moment of silence just a little quiet, maybe to take a couple of deep, deep breaths so we could be here a little bit more intimately together tonight. There's so much going on in the world in every moment that I think um, it's a lot. It's a lot that we're living in and living with. So maybe we could just take even just 10 seconds. Thank you. So thank you for coming tonight, and again, I want to thank 5050 and Ripple Films and Tiffany for live streaming this event tonight um, around the world. It's a great honor to be a part of the project. Um, many of the women on this panel, we've had incredible moments together, working on many, many fights and many long campaigns, and we all keep going because we have to. And this week is also an incredible week. It's also the um, Take Our Daughters to Work, which was a campaign that I worked on for many, many years. Obviously, the Earth Day campaign. Um, earlier this week was the Goldman Awards, the largest environmental awards um, in the world. We had five women win this year, which was an unprecedented uh, number of women to win. I hear a lot about that this is the year of the women and this is our time. We've been doing the work for a long time. And I think what's different right now is that many things. The fight is coming from every which way. And I think those of us that worked on Hillary Clinton's campaign, some of us are up here that worked on that campaign, were really, really fundamentally changed by the disruption of our democracy. And many of us really spent time trying to think about what was next. So in that context, and in the context of what's next for women's leadership, and 50-50 parity, in equality, in equity, I'd like to introduce our panel and have them first talk about their work. So I'm going to introduce them each one by one. Maybe Christine, we could start with Christine. Christine is a dear friend. She is a trailblazer. She is a force. She is relentless. She is so hardworking. And I feel so honored to be by her side in a lot of these campaigns and fights for women's rights. She's a trained attorney. She's the chair of the California Women's Caucus. And she's been doing some really, really important work in Sacramento in a campaign that's called We Said Enough. So I'd love for Christine to talk a little bit about her work, and then we'll move on to Natasha. Christine. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Happy getting to 50-50 day. Let's make sure that when we talk about getting to 50-50, we're also not just talking about 
people who identify as women and everybody else being in 50-50, but we're also talking about the full racial inclusion as well and making sure when we say women, we don't default to white women, but in fact, we're talking about Native women and African American women mm -hmm. and Latinx women, a AAPI women, because we really have to look at the entire spectrum. In fact, when we look at San Francisco's representative and my own mother, Nancy Pelosi, the House Democratic leader, um, it presides over the most diverse House Democratic caucus in history, the most diverse political caucus in history. It is a majority of women, communities of color, LGBT, and people with disabilities. That is what we aspire for everywhere. If the entire caucus looked like the House Democratic caucus, it, we would be in a different America. So part of what we want to do is to do that. But what we've been doing for the past six months, and I'm just gonna be very blunt with you, summarized in a sentence that I said in Sacramento back in November. What everybody knows is that there are rapists at the Capitol. What everybody knows is what the New York Times said, which is that Sacramento is a place where lechery finds a haven. And so are the state capitals around the country, and so is the United States Capitol. It's not that different from every other community. It is a place, unfortunately, where because power is the currency of the realm, and the women you see here, this tableau is a threat to that power. One of the things that happens in politics, and it happens in science, it happens in entertainment, and can we just take a moment for Bill Cosby's victims today who finally emerged with justice. It was a very long justice delayed, but eventually it was justice delivered. And the fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter how nice somebody is, it doesn't matter how well you think you know somebody, behind closed doors they can become somebody else. And I've been in this space for 25 years. Over 20 years ago, I was a domestic violence sex assault prosecutor. We had to do this one trial at a time. And what I told people was, quite bluntly, at our group, we said enough.com, the nonprofit we started, no one will thank you for coming forward. No one will say, oh, I'm so glad you accused that rapist. I'm so glad you came forward and accused that person of incest or domestic violence or sexual assault or bullying or race-based discrimination. No one's going to thank you except other victims and other survivors, and even some of them won't thank you. And so we said enough. We said enough of shutting women out by sexually harassing us or racially bullying us in order to try to eliminate us as the competition. We said enough to a society where from birth in hospitals where gender roles are determined and people make decisions based on gender role or assignment or ability or disability, Kids know from the very earliest ages that moms paid less than dad. And by the way, that their child care worker is more expensive than college and is paid less than fast food workers. We said enough to the rape in the fields and at the restaurants. And we said enough to the cuts in food stamps that are happening right now in Washington, D.C. You have members of Congress giving themselves subsidies in the Republican Farm Bill and yet taking food out of the mouths of hungry children. These are some of the same people that say they care about human trafficking. Well, guess what? Food insecure people are far more likely to be groomed and trafficked and sexually harassed and attacked. So we said enough to all of that. We're moving forward in a positive direction towards justice and we need your help. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was an incredible day today to see those women and to see their exhaustion and relief and mixed emotions around the Cosby verdict. And thank you for championing the, such a complex, tough issue all these decades, Christine, so thank you for that. Um, I'd like to introduce my friend, Natasha Middleton. We met many years ago, I think at Mills College in probably some women's or public policy forum. Um, but Natasha is currently a public policy and management uh, analyst at the Alameda County Probation Department. She is a former City of Oakland commissioner who advances policy reforms that affect young people and adults in the criminal justice system. She's currently running for a very competitive seat in Oakland City Council, and we wish her all the best in District 6. And I'd like to turn it over to Natasha to tell us a little bit about your working on and maybe your race. Thank you very much. It's a Thank pleasure you. to be here tonight. Um, it is very exciting because we need more local voices. And my race that I'm in right now isn't until November. However, we have to start early. And part of 
the inspiration of doing this, and part of my training was with Emerge California, which I did a few years ago, that trained Democratic women to run for office, um, is to also be an inspiration. And being in this climate, knowing that there are these challenges that we face on the national scale and that we can no longer depend on the federal government to make decisions for us, and we need to depend on each other locally, it's important and imperative that our voices are heard. It's very important that we have proper representation. And being a black woman in Oakland, it's very important that I make sure that we are represented. So it's an honor to be here tonight. And I am looking forward to the rest of the dialogue. I don't want to keep, keep going because I know we have limited time. But I'm really excited about this. and. Um, Part of, part of the other piece is that it would be great to have something like this in Oakland. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Let's do it. We, that would be great. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, the other piece, my experience being on the commission, um, it was uh, the Public Safety Services and Violence Prevention Oversight Committee, which is a parcel tax and a parking surcharge. And that particular committee or that particular measure generates about $26 million in revenue annually. And mm -hmm. that is a large responsibility. Mm -hmm. But it was the great ex best experience that I got to really understand the greater landscape of running for city council. So I chose to take the next step. And I encourage others to do the same. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha. I really encourage people to go to Natasha's website and learn about her race and find out how you can support her in Oakland. That would be really fantastic. Um, I want to introduce Jackie Smith, also a good pal of mine. Uh, Jackie and I spent about two years traveling around the country for Hillary Clinton's campaign, mm -hmm. so we've really been through a lot together. Sure. And, <laughs> um, and I don't know if people saw the beautiful handmade felt banners that said Hillary on them around the country and on news programs and in rallies and marches, but uh, Jackie was behind those beautiful felt handmade banners in the um, following the legacy of the suffragette movement. And so she recently wrote this really sweet book that's here somewhere if you would like to learn more about it. Um, but I just cannot tell you how hard Jackie and all these women work um, to really have us have a much better life and quality of life. But Jackie is a small, small business woman owner. Mm -hmm. She's really active in, up in the Sacramento, Roseville area in the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. And she was really affected by the race and she decided that she's gonna run for a state assembly. I mean, how <laughs> cool is that? Thank you. So Thank Natasha you. and Jackie are part of what we will now know historically as the blue wave. <laughs> um, so these women, maybe never thought about it before, but they realized as our democracy was aggressively being pulled out from under us and over us in all kinds of ways, uh, that Jackie decided to run for <coughs> assembly. So you want to talk about your race a little bit? Okay, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Kat. Kat's yeah. been awesome. Is she ready? Okay, is it, am I doing this? Oh, yep, you're I'm good. I'm new at this. Yep, you're <laughs> well, good. that's better. Well, hi, everybody. It's nice to be here. And um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm honored to be here, one of these illustrious women. And um, I am also part of the Emerge Sisterhood, and some of my sisters are here. We're in the Central Valley cohort, <laughs> and we're going to graduate in May. So the Emerge program is fantastic because it teaches women how, and how to be politicians. So the women in Virginia were all Emerge graduates. So, um, so I give Emerge a lot of credit for giving us the gumption to do this. And um, so what happened to me was after November 8th, it changed all our lives, right? So I said, what else could I do? So I got involved with the Democratic Party. I became a delegate. Then I became on the LGBT caucus, and I'm on the e-board, and I met Christine. And um, then I started a Stonewall Democratic Club in Placer County, the first ever LGBT club in, uh, in Placer County, which is the reddest district of California. So it's uh, very red. It went 60-40 to Mr. 
to Mister. And <laughs> <laughs> so I don't even like to so. sew. Anyway, so I started watching my district, and um, I really didn't know about the assembly. To be honest, I was like, you know, one thing about this election, it taught us to look local. So I started watching the assembly, and I was watching how my opponent. You can look him up. 86. I won't mention his name, <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, he started, I mean, he voted against housing for seniors and veterans. He voted against a drug transparency bill. He voted against, he has an F rating with the Sierra Club. I'm like, really, isn't anybody going to go against this guy? And I said, okay, that's it. I'm doing it. So here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm kind of like the little engine that could on the back of the train. So I'm kind of waiting for these congressional women to kind of come to a head. And so then we're going to march together as a slate towards November, and we're going to win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> Jackie, as she said, is in a deeply red state. Yes. She really needs your support. So mm -hmm. if you have time to go up to the Sacramento area and knock on doors, Leading up, she has the, you have the Democratic uh, right. nomination for June, correct? I do. I, I, we're just trying to see if I'm viable with him, so within 10 points. I have all the union supports. I have Teamsters, SEIU, UDW, all of that. And every, pretty much, Anthony Rendon even endorsed me, the Speaker of the Assembly. So I have all these endorsements, but they're waiting to see how viable I am in June. So please come help us. And yeah, please come and knock on doors. It's a lot of fun. We have a lot of practice. We can tell you how to do it. Yeah, we and do. if you're not comfortable with that, <laughs> we can find other things for you to do. But I'll be definitely going to be there myself with a lot of friends knocking on doors this summer to get out the vote and obviously in the fall. Great. So thank you, Jackie, for thank being you. and coming all the way. We really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. So I turn to these wonderful women here, and I want to introduce you to Rose. Probably a lot of a lot of people know Rose Aguilar, who's the host of Your Call on the Daily Show from 10 to 11 a.m. on KLLW. She also recently wrote a book called Red Highways, where she actually traveled around the country and went into red states to tr really try to understand the economic and psychological issues that has divided our country. So I really look, for, look forward to hearing more about that. But also, we were talking earlier about being a journalist. Rose is part of the Native American Journalism Association. But I said to Rose, how do you wake up every morning in being a journalist and knowing what to focus on? I mean, it's, I can't, it just can't, can't be overwhelming. So <laughs> thank you for being here tonight and taking the time and your professionalism and your incredible commitment to progressive causes. So thank, thank you, Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming. Thank you for inviting me. I should say, I actually took that road trip in 2005. Wow. After W was selected the second time, and before it was in fashion to go talk to those people in Texas and Mississippi. Um, I want to thank you, Christine, for mentioning Native women, mm -hmm. because Native women are usually left out altogether, and the fact that you said it first, I almost fell off my chair. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there's so, we're, we're dealing with so much right now, and I really want to start by just telling you a story about progress, which is really close to my heart. I just want to acknowledge, when we're talking about women and gender, my great-grandmother, Elsie Allen, a Pomo Indian was mm. born on September 22nd, 1899, mm. near what is now Santa Rosa, about 90 minutes north of us, not that far. And she worked in the fields at about age 10, and then she was taken from her family to an Indian boarding school. She was taken even further away, up to Mendocino. So she spoke Pomo, she didn't speak any English. They put her in boys' clothing, and she was so bored, so she ran away. A priest up there, connected her with a job here in San Francisco. She was basically a housekeeper, but they were incredibly racist. And so she left, she worked at a hospital. She went back to her land. And at that time, I mean, 1899, it was just <laughs> brutal. The, the murders happened right before then. And she got married, had four children. And in, in her 50s, she became a basket maker. And in Indian tradition, baskets are usually put into, in, into the ground when people die. But her mother said, I want people to know that Indians are not stupid. So I want you to share the art of basket making and travel around and share it with white people. Well, the Indians didn't want her to do that, but she said, no, we need to share this so people know we're not stupid. 
So she became a very well-known basket maker. There's a school named after her in Santa Rosa. And she passed away on December 31st, 1990, at the age of 91. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is two generations ago. Mm. Now, if I were born 150 years ago, I probably would have been raped, enslaved, and maybe murdered. And I have my own radio show. <laughs> I'm interviewing, you name it, they've been on my show. So that is amazing progress. We've come so far when you think about the women, some of you here, I stand on your shoulders. Thank you for all the work that you've done. I think it's so important to talk about that progress. As Kath said, at the Goldman Awards, I've got their photos, mm -hmm. one, two, three, four, five, six women out of seven winners. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Mm -hmm. The teachers that are striking right now, 70 to 80% of them are women. Mm -hmm. So we are making massive progress. At the same time, and we'll talk about this in the, tonight, I mean, when you look at reproductive rights, even in California and rural areas, it is incredibly difficult for women to access abortions. They have to travel long distances. It's very expensive. Um, Kath asked about my show, and we can talk more about it, but it airs daily from 10 to 11. And we think long and hard about what to focus on. So many in the media are following the tweets and following just the scandal of the day. In two to four years, we're definitely going to fill the policies, but a lot of these other things we're not going to remember. We are going to remember, we did a show recently about missing and murdered indigenous women. Indigenous women are killed at rates 10 times that of the rest of the population. The US government does not even keep track of these numbers. Today we did a show about the five-year anniversary of the Rana Plaza building collapse in Bangladesh. In 2018, the women in Bangladesh, who are probably make some of the clothing you're wearing right now, mm -hmm. they're making 32 cents an hour, $68 a month for back-breaking work in the year 2018. We do a lot of shows about farm workers. They can barely afford to buy the food that they pick. So we're at such a, an a incredible time, a difficult time, where we're making so much progress, but we're being pulled back. And I am all for gender parity. I think we need so many more women in office, so many more people of color, LGBT people. But I think we really need to talk about policies. And we need to talk about how we got here because it didn't start with Trump. Mm -hmm. the, the poverty and the homelessness we see outside did not start with Trump. We need to really have an honest conversation about how we got here, the policy decisions that got us here, and what it's going to take to get us to a point where teachers can actually make ends meet so they don't have to take a third job and go on food stamps. So there's a lot to talk about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you so much for having this event, and thank you. Uh, I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you so much, Rose. <laughs> it's really, really moving. It's really moving to talk, you know, to bring your ancestors in. That was really profound for me. Um, I think for all of us, you know, my, my grandmother came here the bowels of a ship through Naples, through Ellis Island, and was a, is also a farm worker. I'm first generation. You know, many of us share these roots, and I think the power of bringing in our ancestors is so important. And I don't, I don't, I've never said that publicly, mm -hmm. but I, I was so moved by what you said about your ancestors, and um, and I I. I listen to your show, and I encourage people to listen to the show that she mentioned in her re opening remarks. It's, it's very profound. Um, and so keep listening to Rose and tell your friends to listen to her, too. Um, I'm excited to introduce Claire Winterton, who is at the Global Fund for Women. So Claire's here tonight to help us also have a global understanding of the issues that Global Fund for Women are working on and the issues that are of concern to frontline women activists around the, wo around the world. F before Global Fund for Women, Claire was the CEO of the International Museum of Women. She's been a longtime advocate for women and children, and she was the former head of communications for one of Prince Charles's charities in the UK. So we're really excited to have you join us here tonight. So Claire, mm -hmm. what are you thinking about? I'm thinking about many of the issues that have been previewed by the other panelists and, and, and so inspired by everything that all of you have shared. Thank you. And I think that what I wanted to inject this evening was just the lens on, look what's happening here and look at the power of emerging leaders and political leaders here. 
And let's just reflect on how that's mirrored all over the world and the work of women activists all over the world. Mm -hmm. And we find ourselves in a moment globally where rising conservatism and rising fundamentalism of all kinds, so not just Islam, but Catholicism, evangelical Christian fundamentalism, um, are really constraining and threatening to roll back women's rights. And there's a really fragile moment um, for women all over the world. And what happens in the United States has a ripple effect and impacts that. So as Rose was saying, you know, the policies of the US government, um, they are regressive within this country, but they actually touch women's rights globally. And the kind of things that we're thinking about at Global Fund for Women and our grantee partners tell us about because we, we fund grassroots women's human rights activism all over the world and we really focus on the global south. And those partners tell us that they really fear what the repercussions will be in exacerbating the situations that they face. And you know, particularly under threat, it will be no surprise, is reproductive health and rights globally. Um, we know that the expansion of the global gag rule, many of you will be familiar with the global gag rule, it prohibits groups that receive US funding from counseling women on the availability of abortion, even whether, when it's legal. Um, that has a huge chilling effect on not just um, abortion rights services for women internationally, but on related services like contraception, um, like HIV services, like um, sex education. We have grantee partners who are now prohibited for getting US funding for even um, environmental justice work because they won't sign to say that they kind of oppose and will not counsel women about the availability of abortion. So, so we know that reproductive rights globally is a massive issue. Um, we know that violence against women is rising. Um, there is many progressive um, legislations that women's rights activists want, for example, to raise the age of marriage for women that are being pulled back in many countries in the current climate. Um, we also know that women's human rights activists themselves are increasingly under threat in many contexts. We have a board member based in Egypt who is essentially under house arrest, cannot travel, cannot speak, cannot organize. Her organization cannot work. And this is happening with increasing regularity all over the world. So I, I think what I want to bring into this conversation is let's remember there are women facing huge gender equality issues worldwide. And what happens here ripples and touches them too. Indeed. Um, I don't want to speak for all of our panelists, but I wanted to shift a little bit to young girls. And because everything you just said, I would imagine, Claire, yeah. you would say is also happening to girls Absolutely. around the world. Yeah. Um, and I don't know about you gals, but when I was younger, I felt different. I felt like a leader when I was a young person. I had a single mom. I don't know if that was it. Mm. I, I really don't know what it was. But ever since I can remember, I just always felt, you know, maybe because I'm an extrovert. I don't know. But I would love to hear from each of you, what, what was innate in you? What woke you to your early leadership as a young girl? Christine, could you speak to that? And I know you have a beautiful young girl, young daughter, Bella. I'm sorry she's not here tonight. It's always so great to see you with Bella. Thank you. Um, Bella and I were at the uh, Commission on the Status of Women, my husband, uh, Peter, yesterday, fighting the good fight. Um, actually, this afternoon, we were at Girls on the Run. Mm -hmm. which is a running club for, um, for young girls. She's nine, and um, a recent bout of pneumonia means she won't be running, but we were walking and dancing, and we, we, we put our miles in. Um, she had a Girl Power t-shirt on, and I think I always felt my Girl Power, probably that's what led me to be an attorney. But I'll, t I'll say this, and, and it really, I think, resonates with, with my daughter. She goes to public school here in San Francisco. She sees that a lot of her teachers, the teachers at her school are women, but the principal is a man. And that struck her. Mm -hmm. um, today we were talking about that. Um, uh, apropos of what Rose was saying, we're, we're big supporters of Proposition G, if you're a San Francisco voter. Um, vote yes on G, the parcel tax, to give our educators a, an attempt at a living wage. But kids know. Kids are smart. 
they go to school and they see that, you know, the power disparities among the teachers and they get a sense of that. They, their teachers will tell them, oh, we're living with roommates, even though some of them are married, or we live over across the bay because we can't even afford to live in San Francisco, or I'm leaving here to go to my other job. Um, so kids know if we tell them education is important, but at the same time we're not funding um, the schools or not, we're not funding their teachers, then they think, well, how important do you really think it is? Right? They can figure that out pretty quickly. I just want to say this one thing. My grandmother never went um, uh, um, beyond, but she did, she did matriculate into law school. Um, mm -hmm. But she, um, one of my um, mom's older brothers got sick and he died. This is before vaccines. And so she had to stay home. She lived a great life in Baltimore, Maryland as the first lady of Baltimore. My grandfather was the mayor. She did a lot of public service. But it wasn't until I passed the bar and I sent her an invitation to go to my swearing in as an attorney. She wrote to me and said, how proud I was to see you accomplish what I could not 55 years ago. Mm -hmm. See, in the back of her mind, mm -hmm. she still had that dream. And so I told people, I actually told this story at Emerge graduation a few years ago, uh, that I made me acutely aware that I was carrying my grandmother's dream. And mm -hmm. I think for a lot of us in public mm -hmm. service or uh, for people who are the first in your family to go to college or go to grad school or to become a lawyer or to run for office, recognizing that you're carrying these dreams forward also makes you more intentional as a parent or as a mentor to younger people because you think, I want them to be the first and go further than I did. Mm. Thank you, Christine. Tasha. Um, for me, uh, there are a few. Uh, starting at age 10, I, um, well, even prior to that, uh, before moving to the East Bay, I lived in the Presidio bef uh, before it, uh, my father was in the military. And one of the things that I cherished when I was there is that as a child, I could roam around. I would roller skate all over the Presidio with complete freedom, mm -hmm. sometimes with my friends, with my dog, or just by myself. And, you know, fast forward to today, some children don't have that luxury. And especially mm -hmm. in Oakland, it's even dangerous just to cross the street mm -hmm. without risking your life. Um, and so I cherish those memories, and I know that my parents had also fostered um, a sense of independence where I felt very comfortable in how I moved. And we also engaged in dialogue and political uh, discourse, even at a young age. So I was very confident in expressing my opinions and, ex and, and having um, a being very firm in where I stood. And then my parents got divorced, um, and then I live with my mother. And uh, politically speaking, I found that I was very upset about nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And so I'm aging myself, but this is way mm -hmm. before the internet. And um, there was a letter writing program to make sure to make people aware about the nuclear freeze, and I was passionate about that. And um, we lived in a one-bedroom apartment, and my mother gave me the bedroom, and there was a spare room. And in that spare room is where I did my homework, and I also sent those letters. So that was another fond memory where my mother um, just encouraged me to continue where I what I wanted to do and where I was passion what I was passionate about. And then I also went to um, an all-girl Catholic college preparatory, St. Rose Academy in San Francisco, which is no longer. Uh, here because it didn't survive the 89 earthquake. Um, however, that education, the single sex education, also um, definitely um, shaped who I am. But part of being in that environment, you already are leader. You are leaders when you're there. And it just, um, a professor from San Francisco State mentioned to us about um, the word educare, which ironically I took two years of Latin in high school. It means to bring out what, what is already there. Mm. And so being in that environment um, and being with those young women, we were very comfortable and secure and um, expressed our opinions on a daily basis. And so those are, those are my earliest memories of mm. um, just shaping who I am and where, I'm, where I am today. And then uh, even more recently, just rem remembering where I've come from. Last year I spent um, time in my father's old, um, his childhood <coughs> town in Florida, and he grew up in segregation. 
Um, and he also grew up in there in the time when Emmett Till was murdered. He was the same age when Emmett Till was murdered, and he was at an all-black high school. And they were all very angry when it happened, and his uh, teacher at the time said, you can be angry or you can debate about it. And they chose to debate. And being with him last year was amazing because it's a reminder that Segregation was not too long ago, Jim Crow was not that long ago, and the right to vote. So I take none of those things lightly. And running for office and reminding myself that this is something we need to cherish and make sure that all others cherish the same and that we have our young people understand that the right to vote is precious. Mm -hmm. So. Um, those are my memories. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate oh, yeah. it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> Ms. Smith. Miss Delaney. Yes. Um, she asked me this question. I had to go back a few years. I can remember being 16, and I was always an environmentalist and a feminist. And in my high school, we didn't have a Sierra Club chapter. And I noticed all the other high schools had it, so I took it upon myself <laughs> to go get, because I, I wanted that in our school to bring awareness to the environment and to get a club started. And so I went through the process and got that started at 16, and we got a chapter in my high school. So that made me my first, my first jumping in and starting. Then my, a year later, there wasn't a senior Girl Scout troop leader, and so I jumped in to be the you know, a Girl Scout leader. So um, for young girls starting out in high school, I highly recommend that you jump in where there's a need and that that's what I've done my whole life. And now that I'm running for office, it's coming front and center. So, and the power of the vote is so important and to teach these young women to vote and to that it does make a difference and that what you do now will, will affect you the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. I, I just want to say one quick thing, because I, I, I didn't ask myself the question, but I grew up in Syracuse, New York, and in high school I got involved with the Syracuse Peace Council, which was a Quaker, oldest peace council in the co country, it was founded by Quakers, and it completely changed my life. Mm -hmm. um, and those really are still my roots, that I learned about feminism and social justice, um, was at the June 12th disarmament march in New York, the, the first <laughs> no-nukes big, big march, and, and we did the Women's Pentagon action, so I am an old feminist. <laughs> um, <laughs> Rose. Well, the, the great-grandmother that, great that I told you about is on my dad's side. On my mom's side, she comes from a very patriarchal culture, extremely patriarchal, and I remember at a young age, the men would always tell the women what to do. Go wash this, get me this. And I said, well, why don't you get it? <laughs> As a young girl. And I just saw that and I thought, this just doesn't make sense to me. Why are the women doing all of the work? And my mom, she did not, no one, I'm a first generation college student, graduate. And she wanted me to go to college. That was her ultimate goal. I don't care what you do. I just want you to get a degree and do what you love. And when I was in college, I did not, I was not raised in a political family. We didn't talk about politics. We really didn't talk about the serious issues of the day. But the library is what got me. Mm. Just spending time in the library. I have newspapers on my lap. Just reading the newspapers every day and having the most amazing teachers. I had a journalism teacher who brought people to class and we had to interview them and then write about it for the newspaper. And my teacher brought a blind man to class and I had never met anyone blind. And it was just uh, incredible to be able to ask this man questions and then write about him in the paper. And then people learned about his life and I thought, you could get paid to do this? <laughs> and it was just no looking back from there. And then I became a journalist right out of college and immediately injustice and poverty and inequality made no sense to me in a country with so much wealth. I mean, in San Francisco, we just did a show with a geography professor, Richard Walker from UC Berkeley, and he writes about how, when you stop and think about it, this city has so much wealth. If the Bay Area were a country, I think we'd be number 20 in terms of GDP. Massive wealth. We also have massive inequality and poverty and homelessness. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what just inspired me to just think this is wrong. Uh, 
military spending, look at that. The administration just got an extra $60 billion. They have to spend it in six months. And I was just reading about all of the helicopters and the fighter jets and all these things, $60 billion in six months. And yet we have all of these struggles happening. So I think that's what, what got it. It just made no sense. And I wanted to be there to ask the questions and to give people a microphone. You know, we always say give people a voice. We all have a, a voice, but it's to give them a microphone to amplify their voice. So it's just to have the power, for example, to bring on girls from Bayview Hunters Point. I mean, they are, I just mapped it. They're about 25 minutes from where we sit right here. These girls talked about gunshots, poverty, uh, the lack of resources, and that this is a neighborhood in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So it's a, for me, it's a gift to be able to bring them on, you know, let them tell their stories, and then hopefully the right people are listening, and we can put pressure on politicians to ensure that those neighborhoods are funded. So that's what kind of get you asked what gets no. me up in the morning. That's kind <laughs> of what gets me up in the morning. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. Claire. Yeah, so I, I grew up in the United Kingdom in the 1980s, which was a tough time, especially in the inner cities. There was really massive youth unemployment. It was very tough. Um, and I went to a school in a neighborhood where people were literally rioting because it was so tough. Um, and there would be buildings on fire every night, and I can remember waiting at the bus stop to get home from school, and people, you know, feeling people gathering on the streets ready to fight, because they were so mad at the level of social injustice that they could see um, in their country. So I think, you know, when I really trace it back, like what made me start thinking about some of these issues about inequality, I think it was that kind of really visceral experience of like injustice and fear and anger and that being, you know, there physically on the streets around me. And going back to what I think is a recurrent theme in some of, you know, in all of these stories, I went to a public all-girls school mm -hmm. where the teachers really wanted created to create a space for us to talk about this stuff and made us feel that as young women, in this community where kind of you could have just felt completely divorced and isolated from everything and literally like politicians were flying in on their helicopters and like landing in our playground basically and like it could have felt completely you know alienating and they kind of allowed us to feel like you know we had a voice and we could talk about this and we could talk about why we felt this might be happening and that started to awaken for me the sense like actually I have a voice in this conversation and mm -hmm. You know, we, we as young women in this community have a right to be heard. And I think that started to give me confidence as I got older to be active in student politics, to be active in local politics, and to find my voice. So, wow. Yeah. Thank you for sharing um, where we all come from. I think it brings a different context to a discussion like tonight. Um, it's less cerebral and it becomes more real. So I appreciate people going kind of back and mm -hmm. to your roots and your um, your youth and share. I, I Because of time, Laura, I think I'm going to actually ask the last question to the audience. And maybe we could have people ask questions in this context to our panelists. Um, Laura, how much time do we have? It's 7.15 now. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. So my last question is now turning to the immediate. So as we said earlier, we are in just an enormous pressure cooker, every which way we look. And all of you are probably working on issues that you're concerned about. So between now and November, what do you feel the priorities are <coughs> to move the country forward? And how do we re reverse this regressive onslaught that we're experiencing around the reversal of policies? And last thing I just wanted to say in this context is that we are part of this blue wave, but this can't be a one-off. This has to be a disruptive design that we integrate into all walks and all aspects of our life, there's no turning back, because 
everything's at stake. If you look at climate, if you look at indigenous rights, if you look at water, if you look at what's happening in Flint, I mean, I mean we could just go on and on. What's happening in, in Iran, they had now 9,000 Nepalis are gonna be deported. You know, I mean, it is just un, it's just, it just gets more evil every day. So I don't wanna connect to the drama of it. I wanna connect to what are we doing? What are you going to do? Because we have to do this together. Because at the end of the day, it's gonna be January, and these women are gonna be elected public officials. They're gonna be moving to new challenges on the, in the National Democratic Party. We are going to have more stories to report. We are gonna have to raise more funds to really understand the connection between the global frontline human right threats and how it relates to local homelessness. I mean, it is all connected. We can be very Bay Area here in some of our language tonight, but we are, right? So I am gonna ask the, uh, maybe Christine, what, do you th what is your priority between now and November? Well, my priority between now and November is really building coalitions. What we do once a week, we get on the phone with um, grassroots social media uh, coordinators for just pretty much a all the issues you just named, and then some. Um, we had a call a couple of days ago, and is everybody from um, John Bauman, who was Bowser, and Sean Anna, um, who's the head of Social Security Works, to uh, <laughs> David Hogg, one of the students uh, from Parkland. Oh, um, you know, and, and, and many groups in between. What we try to do is to have an intersectional conversation, not in the sense of um, thinking that everything is connected. I mean in the sense that things land differently in different communities, right? And so, for example, if you just took one, um, I'm looking for climate voters, and by that I mean people who are forward-looking voters who are gonna really act on climate. And for example, so when we look at what uh, Zinke is doing in the Department of the Interior by moving away the uh, Native American career staffers out of decisions where they're privatizing the monuments. Mm. Um, yes, it's a problem because you can't go hiking at Bears Ears, but it's an immediate um, existential threat to the Native sacred grounds of Bears Ears. And, and so having that kind of a conversation on a weekly phone call with people to say, when we, there are, yes, there are many outrages, but there are also different ways that we should be lifting up the voices of the people who are the direct stakeholders. I'm wearing this um, rainbow cuff. We've been wearing this for almost two years now. It came out of the Pulse nightclub shooting mm -hmm. because um, my mom, Nancy Pelosi, had been to the White House at a Pride event back when they used to do those there, and someone had given her a rainbow cuff in June, and then a few days later, the Pulse massacre happened on Latinx night at a, a largely LGBTQ club, and so she was wearing a rainbow cuff to some of the videos that they were having over gun violence and the sit-in that they did at the Capitol, which uh, just happened in Minnesota a couple nights ago at their state Capitol. And so when we were looking for um, something for her campaign, I said, well, we've all got to get the cuff because everyone loves the cuffs. We're still wearing it. But um, the fact is, after Parkland, the head of Equality Florida introduced some of the Pulse nightclub victims to some of the kids from Parkland. And you saw some of the kids from Parkland realizing they need to reach out and talk to the African Americans who weren't getting that microphone mm -hmm. um, in their own high school as well as in places across the country. So what I'm trying to do, rather than trying to be an expert on all of it, is to at least be conversant on all of it and say, who are the immediate stakeholders? Who are the people directly affected by the policies? Let's find those voices and center them and learn from them in the conversation, and I think if we do that, that's how you build a winning coalition. These wonderful candidates have their expertise, but they're gonna be representing everybody. So their key to success isn't gonna be becoming an expert in the lives of all of their constituents. It's going to be being able to convene, use the power of your candidacy to be the power as a convener, to convene those conversations um, among those coalitions, and if you do that, then you'll win. So that's what I'm doing, and if you're interested in any of those issues, connect with me and I'll connect you to the stakeholders. Thank you. Natasha. So um, my focus is to win that election. That's right. Um, <laughs> and part of getting there is knocking on doors and talking to people, and 
I do have to focus on my district because they're going to vote for me. And the, the voters that I'm looking at, the count is 7,776. And that is the key area that we're looking at. And yes, we'll be talking with them. I want to hear what their concerns are. Um, the One of the major issues that is affecting everyone across the nation and in the state um, is homelessness. Mm -hmm. And it's a crisis. Mm -hmm. And so that is a conversation that's connected not just within the district, it's throughout the city of Oakland, city of San Francisco, the state of California. It is outrageous how many people are homeless. And um, it's really a test of the human condition. How much are we going to do to help people out that are no different from us. And there are people that are probably one paycheck away from being homeless, one mortgage payment away, or warm, one monthly uh, rental payment. And people are living more than two or three in, in um, an apartment or a home. And so it's having those conversations. And I look forward to talking to all the people. It's a the 7,000 the 7, plus that I mentioned, um, and people that have joined me and are volunteering to be a part of this because that's the connection. I think people feel less engaged when they feel sort of disempowered and based on what happened with the election. I mean, we thought, that's mm. it, it's over, but it's not over. Mm -mm. We have to focus locally and we have, we are dependent on each other. We need each other. And so, Part of the semantics, as you know, Christine, is I've got to raise money. <laughs> That's right. And I need people to help me, mm -hmm. to, to walk with me. And so where you can find me is natashaforoakland.com. And at the same time, I want more people thinking about what's next, getting engaged, getting on commissions, getting on boards, being aware of what they can do locally, because it really isn't that far from what's happening in D.C., and so that, that's, that's where I'm at. That's mm -hmm. my focus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. I'm definitely going to walk with you. Good. Yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Jackie. Um, well, in my district, um, it's predominantly Republican. So our job now till November to win is to educate. So we have to get their boots on the ground and get out there and educate and change hearts and minds. And as women, what we learned and emerged that asking for money is the hardest thing for a woman candidate to do. And that's why we're only 21% of the um, legislature. So um, I'm learning now, thanks to Emerge and to, our, to ask for the help because we need money. And I didn't know that Emily, early money is like yeast, Emily's list, I didn't know that. I learned that, that money is what we need to win. And you know, yard signs cost money, you know, Everything costs money. So we have to learn to ask for money, and that's really hard. So I need your support, as Natasha does too, to do this, because we are, we are going up against a wall, and we're trying really hard, but it's going to take boots on and changing hearts and minds. It's like the Obama effect. You know, you have changed one mind, and ten, ten, they changed 10 more. So that's how I'll do it, and that's my goal to get to November, and uh, we're on the right track, and I think we're going to do it. You're going to do We're it. We're going to do You're it. We're both going to do it. <laughs> Definitely going to do it. Um, my day job is raising money. I, I raise money during the day for nonprofit and philanthropic uh, initiatives. I've been doing it for almost 30 years. But my passion has been raising money for women who are running for political office. So my focus between now in November is I've been supporting Delane Easton, who's running for governor. Mm -hmm. I've been raising, helping Jackie. I want to help Natasha. I want to talk to you about that. I want to try to mobilize my list. Um, I'm also helping a woman who's running in Contra Costa County uh, for assembly, um, Rebecca Kahn Bauer. And I'm helping a woman in Georgia. So I do that on my nights and my weekends, and you can too. And I can tell you, for raising money all these years, it is the most difficult time to raise money because it has now become so competitive. This is a good thing because we have so many wonderful women who are running. So the only way these women are going to win is that they're going to get their friends and family and their friends and family's network 
to go online and make donations or give a monthly donation or a weekly, whatever it is, doesn't matter if it's five bucks, it really makes a difference. And those monthly contributions for races like theirs really is their cash bread and butter. So if you give 10 bucks a month, 50 bucks a month, that pays for their signs. That pays for their loan campaign manager. The whole social, I do, I have, I'm my expertise, I work in an agency, is social media is part of what I do. It's so complex out there. So they have to have crowdfunding pages, they gotta tweet, they gotta go on Facebook, they gotta do this, they gotta do that. It takes so much time. And it takes a lot of coordination and a lot of effort and they gotta get b above the noise. So please, when you go home, go to their websites and really learn about their races and please give them some money tonight. I would really appreciate that. Rose, what is your focus <laughs> between now? <laughs> what is your focus? You don't have to raise any money, do you, for the radio well, show? Yes, actually, we See? do. <laughs> See? Okay? You just can't get away from our, it. Rose. Our, our pledge drive, KALW Public Radio, we're <laughs> completely funded <laughs> by, my show is 100% funded by listeners. Mm. And so we have a pledge drive starting in just a couple weeks. I really encourage you at this time, especially, to support local independent radio, local independent journalism. We used to have a lot more media in the Bay Area, and unfortunately we don't. I'm mm -hmm. sure you've heard of the hedge fund groups that are buying up media organizations, but that's really important. Because we are independent, we are able to follow the money. There is so much money in politics. I mean, even at the local level, but when you get to the national level, hundreds of millions of dollars, mm -hmm. and a lot of it is dark. We don't even know where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. And we do the research to follow it, to find out, how did this bill get passed? What committee is this person on? Scott Pruitt, look what is happening with him. In fact, on our show tomorrow, every Friday, we have a media roundtable where we invite three journalists on to talk about coverage of the week's news. Well, Pruitt testified on Capitol Hill today, so we're gonna talk about that tomorrow. And then every Monday, we're doing a One Planet series. So we focus on everything from climate change to plastic pollution. We're mm. talking about Bear's Ears. I mm. think it's in two Mondays. And then on Wednesday, we are doing a special San Francisco June 5th election special. Oh. Because I was watching the coverage, and I'm I, it's not very good. No, it's not. Some of the candidates have a l very long voting records, but we're not learning about those. So every Wednesday, we're ha doing a second hour from 11 to noon. We're gonna have interviews with the major candidates in the coming Wednesdays. We're also talking about what's on the ballot. If you live in San Francisco, childcare, tasers, uh, legal assistance for renters, education, there's a lot of really important things on that ballot. This is how people get educated, by media. And so what we're planning to do is to drop fact bombs because we still believe in facts. And I really, you know, I think that in many ways we are just being lied to about where we are in this country. I do not believe that we're totally divided. A hundred million mm. people did not vote right. in the last election. Mm. We need to spend more time talking about that. We need to spend more time talking about these heavily gerrymandered districts where the Dem could get more votes and the Republican still wins. We have to talk about voter suppression. So many people of color were totally humiliated in 2000 in Florida. Yeah. Are they voting again? <laughs> I, I would say probably not. I, why isn't this getting more attention? I think these issues are all connected and so, so important. There's one study that I wanna share that I always share. A couple years ago, Business Insider polled registered voters and asked for their preference among three congressional budget plans. So they looked at the Republican plan, a Democratic plan, and the progressive wing of the Democratic caucus plan. Guess what budget even the Republicans wanted? Progressive. Progressive, <laughs> yes. I mean, when I went on my road trip, when you talk to someone for an hour, not just a sound bite, you find that everybody wants their kid to go to a good school. They, obviously they want health care. they want a good job. I mean, it's obvious. Unless you're incredibly wealthy, then you just want tax cuts, which is, they got massive tax cuts. I don't even think that we're gonna feel these tax cuts for decades to come. But this is just so important. If you hear something in the media that you don't like, or you don't think that they're going far enough, or you think that they're trying to normalize where we are right now, where things just shift even more to the right, send an email, tweet, Facebook, call. Journalists are easier than ever mm -hmm. to reach. Editors are easier than ever to reach. 
just quickly, here's a great story. When Palin was chosen by John McCain to be his running mate, NPR was calling her pro-life, pro-life, pro-life. And as a citizen, I wrote them and said, pro-life? What does this mean? I mean, the Republican platform, they're cutting head start. I mean, name it. It's just not, what are you talking, what is pro-life? They had a meeting. And now they use abortion opponent and abortion advocate. The language is really, really important. So if you hear something like that, I mean, we answer our emails, our listeners, when they have story ideas or when they have criticisms, we really listen and take it to heart. So become active in the media. And really, please support independent media because we would be in a very bad place without it. Thank you so much, Rose. Thank you. Claire. Um, could you say a little bit about the mission? I would just want to make sure people mm-hmm. here have an understanding yeah. of the mission of the Global of Fund course. for Women. And with a global organization, how do you and your colleagues um, prioritize what to work on? And maybe mm-hmm. you could say a little bit about the mission and what initiatives you're working on now globally. Absolutely. Um, So Global Fund for Women has been around for 30 years. Um, It was founded in the Bay Area by women who recognize that philanthropic efforts and development efforts um, usually completely ignored women. And they ignored grassroots women especially because those women um, were basically not able to carry and manage the amount of money that mainstream philanthropy wanted to disperse. So because they were small and because the amount of money that would be catalytic and transformational for them was not big enough, mainstream philanthropy wasn't serving them because it was going to create too much effort, too much work to disperse those small funds of money to community women. But yet, at the same time, I think you know we increasingly all know that it's women at a very grassroots level who can really diagnose, understand, solve, respond to the challenges that they're facing in their own communities. And we're starting to realize the real challenges of development models that say, let's all sit in San Francisco or wherever and diagnose what this community needs and go in and implement it. Actually, Global Fund for Women's philosophy is the opposite of that. We want to understand what do grassroots human rights women's groups want to do in their local communities. Let's give them money to do exactly that. It's not project funding. It's not the ring fence to deliver a vision that we have. Mm -hmm. It's to pursue the agenda that they want to pursue. So I think that's the kind of core thing. To understand, we focus on grant making in countries in the global south. We try and raise visibility and voices of women who are working on behalf of those issues. We give relatively small grants. Um, So an average might be $20,000 for a year. Last year, we gave around 300 grants to groups in 60 countries. Um, and, it's, and it's hard to prioritize because there are far, far more groups that need this funding mm-hmm. than we can disperse. So, you know, over 3,000 groups needed funding from us last year. We, we don't have that volume of funding right now. So our, our sort of mantra and our promise, as you like, is we try and get the money where it's going to make the biggest difference in the fight for gender equality. So we have program staff, we have advisors, Um, in every country that we work in, over 200 global advisors. And they help us diagnose where are the sort of tipping point catalytic moments, um, particularly, unfortunately, this time in terms of holding the line and stropping rollbacks against women's rights versus necessarily pushing the needle forward, which is ultimately where we would want to be. But where are, you know, conservative forces, conservative governments, um, fundamentalists trying to um, push women's rights backwards to sort of reimpose abortion bans, to mm-hmm. lower the age of child marriage, you know, whatever it may be. And we make sure the grassroots women's human rights groups in those communities have the funding that they need to mobilize. And, and I think the other dimension that's important to highlight here is that the way we think about change is that it's led by movements of women. And we see that here in the United States. We've seen that really in the past two years. Um, The research tells us that if you look at, for example, um, gender-based violence and where are the countries that made the biggest strides on protecting women against gender-based violence, What makes the biggest difference is the existence of really vibrant grassroots women's rights movements. That's what guarantees you will get traction and progress 
on those kind of issues. That matters even more than progressive governments in really assuring lasting gains for women's rights. Mm -hmm. So um, that movement-led philosophy of change is really critical. Mm -hmm. It's really critical. I was saying to Claire and Rose before we began, I was at the Goldman Awards on Monday. This next year will be its 30th year. And I've been going, I think, almost each year for 29 years. It's hard to imagine. But um, there were two women from South Africa mm -hmm. that worked together to stop a $76 billion nuclear plant that the Russians and the South African government were going to be rolling out next year. Two women, one African, South African, who came from Soweto, and a white South African from, from Cape Town, came together in their community organizations. They convened their community organizations and their community groups. And these women, over a two-year period, grassroots, their strategy was every time the government convened and their motorcades came into town and the Russians came into town to meet with the government officials, they stood outside. They had a legal strategy, they had a grassroots strategy. How come we don't know about this? Did anyone know about this? I mean, it just blew my mind. These women were so unbelievable. And these are just two of the type of women that Claire works with every day around the world. Mm -hmm. There are these unbelievable women. I was very blessed. I worked for Bella Abzug. I worked for Mat Mat Matari, uh, Matai, Wangari Matai. I've been in unbelievable moments of my life. But the moment that we're in right now, we've never seen anything like it. So we really have to come together. We really want to hear from you now. Thank you so much for being so patient and gracious Why all us gals talked a lot, because you know <laughs> how we do. We like to talk because we got a lot to say, right? Because we got a lot going on. So Laura, who would like to ask a question? Yes, sir, here. I think I Laura's know. bringing you the mic so way. we can all hear you. Testing one, two. Uh, one of the one of the issues that uh, from the last election was that 54% uh, of white educated women, college educated women, mm -hmm. uh, voted for Trump. Uh, how do you you know how do you imagine being able to uh, as a as a women's force overcome that kind of uh, momentum or statistic or whatever yes. the right term is. I'll just say one quick response. I'd love to hear what Christine has to say about this. Um, there's a great essay that Gloria Steinem wrote years ago in the, in the Guardian about I'm the end of the baby boomer generation. There are still women in the baby boomer generation that didn't make their own money. There is a whole economic analysis about women's relationship to power and women's relationship to Hillary Clinton's leadership. It's, very, it's a very thoughtful, wonderful article that Ms. Steinem wrote, and I encourage people to read it. Until we as women and as organizers can, and I have to say this diplomatically and delicately, and I love coaching on how to say it correctly, and I'll probably not say it correctly, we have to move beyond, not beyond, we have to have parallel strategies around reproductive rights and economic justice and equity. This moment that we're in right now has to be an economic moment for women. And as the Democratic Party leaders and organizers, we have to do a better job connecting to economic issues for women of all walks of life. We have a big class issue. People on the campaign, Hillary's campaign, heard me for two years. We did not, we were not in front of enough grassroots people. It is so relentless to raise the money mm -hmm. to run for office. We have to get money out of politics. Mm -hmm. Hillary had to spend so much time raising money that we couldn't get into the communities for a lot of different complex reasons. So I hope, I would love to hear what Christine has to say about that as well, about how do we engage the women that we, we, we saw vote Republican or independent in the last cycle, and how is the party bringing them in? What strategies are you all working on? Well, let me just say, <laughs> as a married white woman in that cohort, 
we're the worst. Okay, let's just be real. We lived this with Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was white Democratic white Democratic women who put Arnold Schwarzenegger over the top. It was white women in um, Virginia who were for Cuccinelli. Charlie McAuliffe only won because black women and w other women of color and, and immigrant women in Northern Virginia put him over the top. So I think the first thing I, I would say, and I always say, is um, chase your base. Hello, Tasha. <laughs> <laughs> Trust black women. Trust women of color. That's your base. Trust the women who didn't vote to try to bring them out. I don't need to have a conversation with someone who voted for Donald Trump to see if I'm going to have an atonement exercise. What I do need to do <laughs> is go out to somebody who didn't vote and say, what's your purpose? What's your call to service? How can we help? I do think on the money front, I think two things. First of all, having more women at the table of the, at the campaign and more grassroots women at the table in a campaign will also lead you to do more money uh, in communities of color. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you look at, um, yeah, there was a ton of money that was being spent, but how much of it was spent on urban radio? Right, how much was spent on Spanish language radio? How much of it was spent in the community? So I think we have to be really clear about that. Second of all, and I've made this one of my big issues at, uh, as a member of the Democratic National Committee, I've tried to get corporate money out of the DNC. As some of you may have seen, I failed miserably at that about a year ago when I tried to get all corporate PAC money out of the DNC. But I came back last fall with a resolution that said, at least let us ban all predatory givers uh, cor corporate checks that conflict with our party platform. So that meant no money from the gun industry, but also the corporate PACs into which they pay into. Guns, payday lenders, tobacco, nuclear. I'm on a, on a my new one now that I'm trying to move forward on is to get oil money out cool. of the yeah. DNC. Yeah. Because I think that what you do as a candidate and what you do as a Democratic Party, by the way, they fought me tooth and nail. The day that we won in October, um, we were in Las Vegas, and I was like, really? In Las Vegas, the site of the biggest gun massacre in the country, you're actually going to vote against my resolution banning gun money at the DNC? Wow. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. But even after it passed, the staff was leaking to the national press. There's no legal authority for that. When the press said, what do you think? I said, well, wait for that first corporate check to roll in from a, uh, from a PAC that's uh, opposed to our platform, and we'll see how legally binding it is. But here's what happened after Parkland. The DNC was working hand in glove with Gabby Giffords and the kids from Parkland and Idea Pendleton's organi um, legacy organizations to make sure that we were fighting the NRA. And what did they keep saying? We don't take NRA money. We don't take NRA money. So, uh, you know, sometimes we have to save ourselves from ourselves. Mm. And in, in this instance, I think if candidates go out there and say, I'm not taking money from big oil, big soda, you know, the gun makers, et cetera. And instead, I'm trying to take money from organizations that reflect my values. I think that will attract more voters to our cause. I also think it is a false dichotomy to talk about um, economics and um, uh, so-called identity politics. Economic rights and civil rights are bound together as one, and we will lose if we erase our base and go chasing after other workers. There's a way to bring people in, but I think that we are better off going after non-voters and try to get them to vote than we are trying to convince voters mm -hmm. that they were wrong about Donald Trump. Right, right on. Right. Mm. Do we have another question from the floor? Uh, okay. Ms. Pelosi already asked, answered this question. Uh, do any of you send your children to public schools? My daughter's at El Cerrito High School, Claire. Um, uh, Crazy Balls Charter School in the city. Charter School in the city. Where's your Where's your daughter again? Where's Where's Bella at school? Oh, she's in a, a public school. In public, the school. public school. And yeah. And my son went to uh, public schools. Right. Yeah. Your son went to public my son school. Went to public school. I don't have kids, but if I did, they'd be in public school. <laughs> <laughs> but we do a lot of shows about public education. We bring on teachers on a regular basis. And I'm glad you brought that up. I just learned that in Finland, they don't even have private schools. They're so well funded that they don't need them. They have incredible food in the schools. They just don't need them. This is a, a very important issue about funding public education. Okay, we've got two more questions here, one here. About money and politics, how do we reverse the Citizens United decision? How do we erase it? 
It's very complicated because what Christine was saying earlier, you have to realize there's also investment portfolios. So in the investment portfolios, I just had a long call with uh, an activist who went to testify in Sacramento to try to get CalPERS, who a lot of our retirement funds through CalPERS, to, di to disinvest, you know. Many of us here, I'm sure on this panel, worked on the South Africa divestment campaign. And there's a lot of precedent, but they, what CalPERS said is they felt that they could still have more clout being invested in the NRA than not. I don't know if I got by it. I'm just telling you what I heard, right? So I think that, um, Christine, do you have a quick response? Because I want to Very hear, quickly, yeah. because in terms of Citizens United California, we have a couple things we've done. We've done AB 249, which um, requires um, ad campaigns to talk about the top three funders. We have a bill actually right now in um, Sacramento that, funny enough, Facebook was fighting it, fighting it, fighting it now after aggressive questioning by Anna Eshu <laughs> and others. They're now suddenly with us on our, what we call the Honest Ads Act mm -hmm. that would also require funding for um, internet-based ads. So how do we overturn Citizens United? Disclose, disclose, disclose yeah. right now wherever we can. They passed something in New York two weeks ago and um, again, we're on a good path in California, but also electing candidates who are for overturning Citizens United and ultimately, you know what it is, you got to elect a president and a Supreme Court that will overturn Citizens United. Mm. I think we have time for one more question. Woman here, Laura's bringing you the microphone. Well, uh, ladies, yes. one thing that I was very encouraged to hear is all the way across the board, except for the lady who didn't have any kids, you're sending your kids to public school. Because mm. I remember one grave disappointment I had is I went to one of my husband's um, lodge dinners, and they had a speaker, you know, one of the brothers, who was a superintendent in one of the local schools, and he also introduced a lady who was a trustee. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting down at dinner with him afterwards, you know, he's talking about all these things he's doing for his school, and these are elected positions, you gotta understand. Mm -hmm. And I ask him, so, where do you send your kids to school? Oh, I send my kids to Holy Cross. I'm of the opinion that there's no way in heck I would vote for somebody to be a superintendent of a... Ask your question. Oh, okay, that isn't my question. That was... I'm sorry, I didn't no, it's okay. mean to ask a question, but I wanted to say how pleased I was with Thank you. Thank you. We that really you were sending your kids that. to public school. Thank you. Because I wouldn't vote for somebody Thank you. who would do otherwise. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry, okay. No, no, oh, you, you did it fine. You did it fine. Laura's job is to close the show. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's what her job is, and you did a beautiful thing saying that. My daughter goes to El Cerrito High School, and they didn't have enough chairs in the classroom. The kids sit on the floor. Okay, I'm talking about El Cerrito, 10 minutes from the University of Berkeley. Okay, we got a town and gown problem in our counties, okay? I don't know if people know that term of art, but, you know, we have the most prestigious universities in the world here and we have an incredibly under-resourced school district. And as Christine said earlier, our teachers are not being paid a living wage. They can't afford to live here. We got a lot of challenges. I want to thank the Mechanics Institute so yes. much. I want to yes. thank Laura Shepard and her wonderful team and our sound person and all the staff. And I want to thank Christine and Natasha and Jackie and Rose and Claire, and please go to their websites and learn about the, their work, and please make a donation to their campaigns. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night, Laura. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone, for coming for this inspiring event and conversation. We hope this is a call to action. It's for justice, equity, equality. So get out to the streets, everyone. And now, if you wait for just a few minutes, we have some refreshments for you, and we hope you'll return. To the